Hi folks, Chief Master Kirk Kenny Smith, Total Force Training Group. This is a remake for <laughs> probably about the sixth time of one particular video. Uh, before I say this, I only want to say I'm very big on being open-minded with whatever you're training. Um, even if the only thing you learn from someone else's technique is the reason why they do it this way and that it doesn't work for you, you may get something to their logic. And one of the techniques that is greatly bashed in the American shooting community is the Israeli draw. Uh, before I go on and say anything more about that, I'm going to say I carry condition one, uh, I always do, uh, with two exceptions. Uh, if I'm carrying a gun in a bag for some reason, then I'll leave the chamber empty. If I'm carrying, like if I'm just coming out here to work out or something, I slip my pistol in my waistband, I'll leave the chamber empty. Just in case I slip or something or if it falls out of the waistband or whatever. Uh, the Israelis have their reason for doing things the way they do it. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the Israelis draw, the gun comes out, right, and fire. All right. Obviously this weapon is clear. I confirmed that multiple times before I uh, did that there. Uh, you know, I knew that for a fact it was clear. It was verified and checked. You don't need to see me do that all the time. Okay. Obviously, it's clear, click, click, not boom, and I did verify that, so make sure if you're going to practice dry, you are ensuring that you're being safe about it. All right, I shouldn't have to tell anybody here how to be safe with dry firing. If you have a boom, boom, that's your fault, not ours. Um, back to the, the Izzy draw itself, all right, the gun comes out, and I'm just being fluid about it, but uh, realistically, there's not much difference between that draw stroke and the American combat draw stroke. A lot of people who want to demonstrate this technique will do it like that. That's just not the way the Israelis train it. Um, have I trained on the Israeli draw? I certainly have with an IDF veteran uh, by the name of Mike Lee Canary. It was an actual live shooting course, but it was a primer during a handgun disarming course. Uh, their logic to the, to the reason they carry condition three and draw along the way Dates back to when the IDF was first uh, instituted back in the late 40s. Uh, late 40s during the War of Independence with the uh, Palmak, Naganah, which are the, the forerunners of the modern Israeli Defense Force. Uh, the first standard pistol they had was the Browning High Power. Now, I like Browning High Powers, but like all single action pistols, to be carried with around in the chamber, it really needs to be carried with the safety on. Uh, it can, be, of course, be carried condition two with the hammer down on half cock. But that's never as advised. That's never advised. Um, you know, unless you're one of those who grew up on a single action revolver and are used to thumb cocking a hammer. Uh, and even then, I still would highly implore you to carry cocked and locked if you choose to carry a single action. But when you look at the early Browning high powers, uh, look at the English from Canada or any of the British ones or even the early Belgian ones, the safety levers are extremely small. All right, they're extremely small, extremely hard to hit under pressure. All right. Matter of fact, about the same time, the U.S. military was actually taught to carry their 1911s with uh, an empty chamber. At the same time, draw out of the flap holster bracket and come up on target. And I actually have an old U.S. Army field manual describing that process. Um, I think it's it's the old combat training with pistols and training with pistols and revolvers or something like that. Uh, I'll look it up somewhere in the house. Um, but it, it's out there. They did train with that at one point. They just went about it in a slightly different way than the Israelis. Um, when two-handed shooting started coming into vogue, the Israelis figured, well, number one, the sights on early military pistols were tiny. That's why they point shoot. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, inside close quarters, I point shoot. Um, by close quarters, I mean like from me to the camera. Very, very close. Um, you know, not necessarily from the hip, but a half extension, you know, a three-quarter extension, and by all means a full extension. You know, now that I'm using big dots, it's really easy to get a pretty sight picture, but metal on meat works pretty well. It ranges the meat of the camera, all right? Confirming my sights, I'm on the lens, and now I'm just metal on meat, and I am about a quarter of an inch or so below the lens now, or below the center of the phone, rather. So it, it is a workable concept in, in the right place. But uh, I'm not saying it's general purpose, but that's their theory. Now, when you draw a weapon, all right, they don't draw some form of ready position and rack the slide. That's counterproductive, and of course that's slow. 
They actually, there we go, got that poster stuff on there, all right, they will actually draw to here, okay, and the weapon's pointed in, punch it through, they get their first shot out right there. All right, it's actually a fairly quick process when done properly. And again, this isn't something I train on all the time, so I may not necessarily be the, the best guy to be giving this a good showing, but at speed, all right, it's not the greatest thing in the world, and I'm not used to this. I'm used to meeting here, but uh, you know, I understand though the reason why they do it. Which, when you think, looking at that motion, and I'm telling you, one, access the gun, two, bring the gun up and pinch the slide, three, push it all the way forward, hands come together, and fire. And of course, they'll be down in here when they, they do it as well. All right. That's fairly easy to teach somebody versus magazine in, rack the slide, put it on safe, put it in the holster, draw the gun, take it off safe, start shooting. You know, we're not talking about people who go to gun schools all the time. We're talking about someone, a, a military draftee who's probably never touched one before. All right. Much easier to train. And now when you look at that little bitty safety lever, what's the first thing people want on a handgun with a manual safety? Usually a bigger manual of safety because it's more positive. Uh, when I carried my 1911, the first thing I put on it was a Wilson Combat Ambidextrous Safety. A straight up. Uh, you know you need it. The safety on the Browning High Power is a far cry from what's on the 1911. I think the High Power is a better weapon overall by, by every stretch of the word. But the manual of safety needed a lot of work. Um, so you get this just draw, cock, shoot. Now the safety is not an issue. Which brings us to another thing, safety itself. All right. When do most people have accidental or negligent discharges? When loading or unloading their weapon. Back to life. All right. Keep that in mind. And everybody who served in the military understands weapon comes off the rack. The armor verifies you're good. Here you go. All right. You take your weapon from your armor. Clear. Holster up. Well, with the Israelis. They hand you your weapon empty, clear it, drop the, drop the striker, holster it up however, they issue your rounds, pop it in, and you go about your day. All right, there's no racking of the slide in there. Okay, so obviously that, that brings up one safety issue. The second is, back to an instructor standpoint, uh, for those of y'all that haven't seen, I, I, I was a marksmanship coach when I was in the Marine Corps, and trying to coach someone on the Beretta M9, which I'll say the Beretta M9 is a fine pistol, it's nothing against the design, has a double action, single action trigger pull. Well, the Israelis went from the high power to the Jericho 941 and later the SIG 226-228, which also had a double action, single action trigger pull. This is something to keep in mind. All right. Anybody who's done a DAS, who's ran a DASA pistol knows that it's much easier to learn one trigger pull than two. All right? So you've got the long, heavy first and the short, easy second, which typically on most people, I mean, I have pretty big hands, so it's not that big a deal for me. I've got very, very good hand strength, grip strength, rather, from doing martial arts for so long. But most people don't have the kind of grip strength necessary to manipulate a double action trigger with the very tip of their finger. Most people will use the joint. And then manipulate the single action trigger with just the tip of the finger for more accuracy. Uh, trying to teach that, it, it, it's very doable. I've done it, but it's not the easiest. It's much easier when I can just say one trigger pull. Well, with a DASA pistol, when I draw cock, do I have a double action first shot now? Of course not. Now, mind you, with the Jericho 941, just like you would run into with the Beretta M9 or any number of. Uh, other semi autos out there with a slide mounted safety and decocker switch, you, you do have to be mindful of that. But, uh, you know, they, again, it's, it, it is still doable. Each, each technique has its causes. And if I was ish, if I was issuing the Jericho 941, Beretta M9, uh, Smith & Wesson, pre M P Smith & Wesson semi auto, excluding the Sigma and the SD, of course, that had a manual safety up there or Ruger or something like that. That had that slide mount safety, this would not be the technique that I would choose to teach, regardless of, of the reasoning, just because I wouldn't want to put the weapon on safe. Uh, I'm of the book, I'm of the opinion that a weapon comes 
on safe only when it's being relinquished to the holster or the swing. Um, you know that, that that's just my personal opinion. You know I carry Glocks and I like weapons that don't that are not very easy to put on safe. Um, you know because if I'm expecting trouble, I put it on kill and I go on about my business. When I'm relinquishing control, I put it on quiet mode and usually sling it or holster it. So, uh, but that that's just my personal opinion. But back back to the issue at hand. When you're dealing with trying to teach someone in a matter of a couple of months how to manipulate a pistol, if you can eliminate having to teach them two separate trigger pulls, you've made it that much easier to teach them what they need to know to get that gun into the fight. Um, and obviously you've got the, the issue of now you're not racking rounds in the chamber until an instant before you fire, which is how the basic pistol safe, basic uh, firearm safety classes pretty much teach anyway. Uh, Normally I don't quote those too often, but it actually helps me this time, so I'm going to. But most of those are not suited for fighting at all. That's why I don't quote them. But in this instance, it's using the Israelis are using the same logic, uh, and their reasoning actually extends far beyond that. Israel being a fairly urban area, you know, let's say you're walking and you're walking, and we're moving along. We're at left. The you know, weapon comes up here. Alright, I've taken my turn. Let me go real quick. Alright, I've taken my turn and drawn my weapon into this, this position. Is it a threat? Roger. Rip it right through and get, get my shots off. Problem solved. It's not a threat. Are they in danger? And around the chamber. Of course, we shouldn't go around pointing guns at things that aren't verified threats. But sometimes we don't get that chance to verify it, okay? Uh, I know someone's going to fuss about this. The world is full of threats and they're draped in camouflage. We don't live in Israel, okay? We don't necessarily have to worry about everybody walking beside us wearing a bomb under their shirt, all right? If we did, we would probably be a little bit more quicker about how we reacted to things, all right? You're sitting there. You're moving on about your business, okay? Maybe you're an executive protection professional plainclothes police officer, whatever, you're moving about your business, you see a threat, you're coming up in here. Maybe they drop their weapon and give up. You know? Oh, of course, you can go ahead and wrap around in and, and take them into custody without firing a round. But, suppose you come in here and now your partner is going to take them down. Your partner's not at risk of having a live weapon pointed at him. You can move your position. Okay? Again, could be as simple as mistaken identity. You're moving, you're moving, threat. Sorry about that. I didn't put around in the chamber. We shouldn't point weapons at things, but realistically, were they in any danger? I didn't say was it right. I said were they in danger? No. Uh, um, now I understand. Before I say this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and say I know a lot of people that have been shot with unloaded guns. But let's be realistic. A weapon that we know for a 100% fact has no round in the chamber is not dangerous. It can't hurt you until a round goes in the chamber. All right. Now I'm not saying I'm not ever a saying that assume a weapon does not have a round in the chamber. I'm not saying that at all. All right. What I'm saying is common sense dictates that we all know that this pistol is unloaded and it's about as dangerous as the light bulbs over my head right now. All right? The worst thing I gotta worry about right now is dropping it on my foot. Or when I lock the slide back and I go monkeying around in there showing it's clear and getting slide bit. Right, that's a, that hurts. Anybody have to have that happen? That hurts. I got, I've not been slide bit with a pistol. I got my thumb bit with an M1 Garam when I was in high school. That's not fun. All right? So, their logic to why they use the draw, cock, and shoot is it gets the weapon into the fight safely and efficiently because they're not drawing and then cocking they're cocking as part of the draw again they're not coming here and waiting a second probably should have worn a different holster for this huh but they're, as they're coming up alright they're drawing straight and I'm actually taking the time to get a sight picture if I was doing this like an Israeli, 
Now I've buggered it. Let me do that one more time. And I just popped out my pocket. Okay. And again, this is not my preferred technique. I don't train it as often as I should. I'll go ahead and say that again. Versus reset my strike right here. Not my best draw. Okay. It's uh about the same speed, honestly, when I actually get a sight picture with both. Because I'm going through the same motion. Now, obviously the advantage of carrying them around the chamber is I can start shooting here. I can shoot here. I can shoot here. I can shoot here. Okay? There are more advantages to carrying with around in the chamber than disadvantages. So I highly recommend carrying with around in the chamber. But a lot of the reasons that I hear of people just knocking their way of shooting are wrong. I mean, it, it's, it's not the way I prefer, but if you're going to call something wrong, call it wrong for the right reason. Okay? Uh, why would I call it wrong? It doesn't work with every handgun. All right? Obviously, I wouldn't want to do that with a Beretta, Ruger P90, uh, Jericho 941, something with a slick slide, like a really slick surface to the slide, like a SIG, SIG set, or SIG, well, like a CZ75, you know, I wouldn't want to do it with that. I didn't like, I tried this technique a few times just to, to master it, not really master it, but just get a feel for it. With my 1911 when I was carrying it, it was a GI type slide, I don't like the crazy target one, the little nub sights. Great gun to one to point, one to point shoot with, by the way, uh, because of those little nub sights. But anyway, you know, it just, it, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world to pull off, and the way my hands sweat, I don't know if I'd be able to do it under stress. But, uh, you know, just something to keep in mind that just like everything else in life, you have to keep an open mind about it because maybe they're onto something. You know, if I were carrying in a bag, all right, if this gun were in a bag, let's see, do I have a bag laying around here? I do not. All right, so we're going to use a simulated bag. I'm going to put it in my hat, okay? I'm trying to wrap my hat around there. All right, this is my simulated bag, like a back expedition or something like that. I go in there. Of course, you know, come out with it, round in the chamber, great, whatever. But at the same time, if I don't have a round in the chamber, maybe I rack the slide so the trigger's forward. Then I put my mag in. Someone, off-body carry, I don't recommend, ever, 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 ever. All right, because I'm friggin' clumsy and forgetful and I leave shit laying around all the time. Leave your stuff sitting there, they pick it up, give me your wallet. What'd you just hear? Quick, right? Not boom. That can buy you some time, all right, to get your hopefully other gun back into the fight, or perhaps even what popped out of my pocket earlier. There, there. You get that in the fight. Maybe even just the empty hand, okay? Whatever it is, it buys you time when they go to rack that slide, all right? Um, and I carry like that a lot. Mexican carry, no holster, and I'll leave the chamber empty just because. Dropping the uh, the weapon in the just the waistband of my grappling shorts, it doesn't necessarily uh, give me good retention, and that's just more to make sure that I don't hurt myself. But uh, they do have their logic, so at least hear them out. Uh, and if you really want some good training on this, look up Garrett Machine or Mike Lee Canaric. Try and learn the Israeli draw from an American. Probably isn't the best idea in the world. Um, it man. The, the Wing Chun guy said, water is purest from its source, and he's right. Uh, if you really want to learn the Israeli draw and get a much better feel of their technique, um, like I said, look up Mike Lee Kinneric or Garrett Machine. They are Israeli. Well, Garrett Machine, if I'm not mistaken, is from Florida. But they both served in the IDF, and they both served in special operations capacity. So they can tell you far more about it than I can. Uh, I, what little of the Israeli draw I know, I learned from Mike Lee. Uh, I can't recommend his instruction enough. I know he is really big on working with Garrett Machine, and that's all I need to know about the man. Uh, but anyway, I highly suggest that you at least hear him out. And this could go for anything. Let's say tomorrow you decide, I want to take a traditional karate class. 
Okay? You're going to hear things from a different point of view, and it might not all be fight-centered. But hear them out. They have their reason for doing kata and waza and the various techniques they do. Uh, so you want to go to a taekwondo class. You're going to do forms. You're going to do one-step sparring. You're going to do ridiculously gay point sparring, which I cannot stand. Even the WTF full contact stuff, it's, it does nothing for me. I mean, it's, it's stupid, to be honest with you. It'll get, it'll get you killed if you try to use those strategies in a fight. You know, you go to some uh, Hapkido Aikido school. You're learning things from a very dated perspective. But every single one of those arts has its merit. And I'm going ahead and slay the golden goose, too. You go to an MMA school, you're going to learn a lot about sport MMA. Keyword sport. A lot of things interchange, some do not. Okay? Rolling around on the ground. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I train in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And rolling around on the ground is the last damn place I want to be in a fight. But I'd rather be able to do it and then get on my feet than just get on the ground and go into vapor lock. Okay? So you have to take what's useful from everything you do. What did I take as useful from learning the Israeli draw? We're shooting, we're shooting, we're shooting, just like a normal American. Click. Tap. Rap. What's that? Same motion. It's the exact same thing. Tap, slide, rap. I use the same motion. Boom, boom. You know, can you do it like this way? Of course. Come underneath. That's a lot of motion. Make sense? Boom, boom. And by flipping the gun, Throwing whatever's coming out of that ejection port out. Now I know some will actually, and there's nothing wrong with this. Go this way. That's fine. Useful motion. And what is it? Where is it coming from? That is really draw. It's the same motion. Alright. Where else can I use it? That hard punch forward. Both hands. I'm a hot keto guy. Uh, keto guys understand this. It's pushing palm. It's the same motion. One, two. All right. Maybe this person's right on top of me. I get one round off. Bang. Or I can hit him and hopefully get off the four more. Okay. So it's the, the motions translate into other things. So keep that in mind. Uh, okay. Let's go to the more of the shooting side of things. Some schools. I want you to shoot in a lever stance. So I want you to shoot in an isosceles. So I want you to shoot you in one of the two that they call their own. I don't care what you shoot in as long as you're getting good hit. Weaver stance to me is good for long range precision with a pistol. The isosceles stance is better for off close fighting. Neither one of them are well suited to walking and shooting, running and shooting, where one handed comes into play. So, whatever you're learning, be it the Izzy draw, uh, modern technique weaver stance shooting, modern competitive type shooting in the isosceles stance, knife fighting, stick fighting, traditional karate, sport taekwondo, sport Brazilian jiu-jitsu, MMA, Krav Maga, whatever you're doing, all right, keep an open mind. Learn what they have. There's logic behind every technique. This is just a little bit on the logic of the Israeli draw and how it ties into things overall. Uh, that's just what I took from it. Your mileage my, it may vary. I am leaving the original video up in the rain, but I'm going to link to this when I figure out how. Hope y'all enjoy this. Stay frosty. Watch your six. Stay in the fight.